Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. The Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 4. If you there, say, Amen. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 4. The Bible says, Draw me, we will run after thee. Hallelujah. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. And he says, and we will remember thy love more than wine. Give me the Amplified. The Amplified says, draw me. This is who? Somebody talking to the king. And he says, we will run after you. The king brings me into his apartments. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will recall when we were favored with your love. More fragrant than wine. And it says, the upright are not offended at your choice, but sincerely love you. Somebody say, Amen. Hallelujah. I came to draw a certain distinction. Uh, in what people think is love, versus what God knows to be love. And what the scriptures say is to be love. The Bible says, But they that do not love do not know God. Hallelujah. If you do not love, you do not know God. For God is love. No man in this world can boast and say, I know God. When you do not have the revelation of love. If love is not revealed to you, you cannot say that you know God. Now the Bible tells us that they that know their God shall do mighty exploits. If you know God, you'll do mighty stuff. There's a promise of you doing mighty things when you know, if you know, if truly you know God. He says you will do mighty stuff. But when the Bible speaks of the knowledge of, 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 of the, the, the knowing of God to, 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 to do mighty things, you cannot say that I know God when love is not revealed. Hallelujah. The highest knowledge of God is the highest revelation of agape. Praise the Lord. He says that they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. But there is no place of saying that you know God if you do not have the revelation which is of love. Because they, the Bible says, that do not love, do not know God. Hallelujah. They that do not love, do not know God. For God is love. Hallelujah. For God is love. For God is love. For God is love. If you do not love, you don't know God. He says, and they that know their God shall do mighty exploits. Now the Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 4 tells you, draw me. This is a guy asking God for a particular invite. Now, I'm going to show you something here. He begins from a place of telling God, draw me, I will run after you. For you draw me, we will run after thee. We will run after thee if you draw us. If you don't draw us, we will not. It, 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 the, the invite begins from Jehovah God to us. It doesn't begin from us trying to invite him. It doesn't begin from us trying to relate with him. It begins with him trying to... I mean, relating with us. It begins with him inviting us. You can never have a relationship without responding to an invite. God is not interested in your invitation for him. He's interested in your response to his invitation. And the psalmist understands that grace, and I've mentioned that, you know, someone before, that God wants to respond to us according to his invitation for us. Not our invitation or responses to him. Our responses to him are not as important as us responding to his invitation first. Not us sending ourselves there. Because that is a zeal that is without, is without knowledge. Somebody say amen. The guy tells God. He says, 
begin by drawing me because there is no relationship that is as deep in God as a man being drawn by God himself. Somebody say amen. So the psalmist begins by saying, draw me, we will run after you. Hallelujah. You draw me, we will run after you. Draw me. Are you hearing me? We, plural. He didn't say I will, we. In other words, there's something about him drawing me that will attract many with me to run after him, right? Because through me, he will draw others. If you lift me up, I'll draw men to myself, right? So he says, the king brings me into his apartments. And he says, we will be glad and rejoice in you. And we will recall, he says, when we were favored with your love. Now that's what I did to tap most. And he says, more fragrant than wine. More fragrant than wine. In a, the KJV says, we will remember your love more than wine. We will remember thine love more than wine. We will remember your love more than wine. Hallelujah. Now I want to borrow something here that I want to delve into and probably will be the total sum of my sermon today. How many of you drank alcohol? You really drank. You just didn't taste it. Temutia. Temutia mwaro kukanga. Wanyura dala. Nganae o manjino ganti vana inze nanyua. No, vanange. Please help me, Munyambi. There are people who don't know that people have drink. Okay, if you used to just drink one or two bottles, put down. I'm talking about people who say, me, a post I used to drink. I have a relative for him, he never used to become drunk. So he can drink as long as you want. As long as he goes to Lelouz to for a short call, he's okay. Put up and say, why are you putting up like that? Put, don't worry, put up straight. Because what? Vanangi. Now, mama. Some people are shocking me. <laughs> Your parents think you're okay. <laughs> you you have not drunk, really? Eh? Uh huh. Now, I've never drunk alcohol, but I've counseled many thousands of people who have had a drinking problem. I'm not just talking about laser. I'm talking about a, a laser drinker, an occasional drinker. Are you hearing me? I'm not talking about just an occasional drinker. I'm talking about, now, if you're occasional, I'm not, you're not the one I'm talking about. You went to a party with your girlfriends and then you drank. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking of somebody, and you could wake up, and the first thing that comes to your head, you could see the bottle calling you. Joseph, come. I'm the one who loves you. The rest are lying. Put up your hand, and you've been there. And you've been there. And you've been there. Uh -huh. Now you, you'd understand what I'm saying. You're the ones now I want to base on to define um, wine. Now, there's a scripture that I, I want to dig out, okay? There's a scripture that I want to dig out. It says, look not on the wine when it is red. Hmm? He was talking to a certain guy. <laughs> I don't know where you can get it for me. There's a scripture where he says that look not on the wine when it's red. Huh? Look not on the wine. Uh-huh when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself. This is the principle in the spirit. Some people don't understand this. This is a principle in the spirit. It's a spiritual principle. You don't look at wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself around. You don't look at it. Because there is something it does to your spirit. Because the eyes, remember the Bible says, are the what? What are your eyes? What are your eyes? They're the light to your body. Hallelujah. They, 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 they expose the dispensation of your soul. Are you hearing me? Because the, the eyes of a man are the light to the body. Anything the body craves for begins from the eyes. That's why it's hard for a blind man to lust on a woman. Because he's blind. How can he just say, ah? No, it just can't happen. It's amazing what these eyes do. It's amazing what these eyes do. It's amazing how your body is responding because of what your eyes see. How together. That is why, because it's a principle, some of you have realized that many times when um, drinking companies are making advertisements, they follow that principle. They show it pouring out. <sighs> Now I was born again, but I honestly love the advert of Tuscamore Lager. 
you remember that time when you were going to watch UEFA? Eh? Those guys are funny. Henneken. You remember Henneken? You remember Henneken? They pour out in a glass. And then, then they slide it. Then kind of a smoky thing comes on. Henneken. <laughs> Some of you remember the advert of Tuscamot Lager? Tuscamot Lager. Then they just... Then the guy just... Book up. Book up. Book up. Then you're like, I'm not born again, but it looks cool. <laughs> it looks cool. You understand what I'm saying? But, do you understand what I'm saying? But it's a principle. <laughs> <He loves it. laughs> but it's a principle. Because you know that if he causes you to look upon the wine when it is red, look at it. When it giveth its color in the cup, right? Yeah? And then when it moveth itself aright. That is why some of you, if it's not that, they would show a guy, a, a lady, right? Holding a glass and then she's like, you understand? He twist it like this, then you're like, maka yendo right? Now, if you're drunk, Adi, mama, 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 you people who drink, you understand what I'm saying? And you've taken like three days without taking it, and then you see the advert. <laughs> There's the way you start to feel in your heart, and you're like, oh, nange, come quickly, Lord Jesus. You understand? You can go out of that gate and start to look for it. Please be on my side. Guys, am I talking the truth? You spend two, three days without drinking, and you feel like you're starting to fall sick. Your body is healthy, but you feel like you're, you're not... You're not you. You're not you. I remember in Tinderview, a certain guy got high of drugs. High. Drugs. High. It was 4 p.m. He was one of those guys that he never visit. Those things hit dysfunctional families. You look at people who did drugs a lot, you realize their families are dysfunctional. Sad. They didn't want it. It just happened. So this guy, it was 4 p.m. He stood in front of the dormitory. Without a shirt, then he stretched like this. Then he said, my day has just begun. Now, 4 p.m., we are planning to go to preps. For him, his day has just begun. In that accent, my day has just begun. How? I don't know whether he, he was going to tell us he was going to stay awake the whole night. I don't know what he was going to do the whole night, but his day had what? Just began. So, heights do anything. Tell your neighbor heights do anything. So, I was telling you, you don't look at the wine when it is red, when it's poured out in the cup, and then it starts whatever, right? Next verse. The next verse says that at last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. If you ever look at it, you're beaten like a serpent. You know what the serpent means? Temptation. You're hit by temptation. So, for those of the guys who want to, 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 to advertise these things, usually to tempt people to drink, they advertise it. Do you know there are people who have drunk because of advertisement? They were not interested. But the way it was... Do you understand? It's not even not necessarily advertisement. You are seated one day, and the guy started pouring something in a... Then you're gonna man, this guy's thing, eh? The way it looks, eh? Are we together? And then you start drinking like that. How can I test all ah, to drink? Let me just try it. You see? And say it says, bites us like a serpent and sting us like an adder. And the next verse says, And thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. There you're high. Right? Yeah, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, and he that lieth upon the top of a mast. And he says, they that have stricken me, so that's, that's another thing. So my point is that if you have ever drunk alcohol, there's a time you reach and you want to stop and you can't. And the people around you think you're just being a bad person, but you can't stop. I know a man they told that if you drink again, sir, your kidney is dead, you're going to die. 
after treatment, he went back drinking. After, immediately after treatment, he went back drinking. Immediately after treatment, he went back drinking. Why did he drink? Because he didn't have the power to say no. He was stung. Do you know when a man is, is addicted to wine, in the spirit realm, he looks like a man bitten by a snake. What does that snake do? The poison will move in that man's system eventually until it dies. Unless he's given an antidote. Are you hearing me? Unless he's treated with the right treatment. Poison doesn't kill immediately, but it surely moves. It starts to disember the systems of that man or that woman. And if it go in the spirit realm, Parts of your conviction start to die. You start to die to common sense. Even things that look really common. Eh? That is why when a person is addicted, you can't start telling, speaking sense into them. Now you look at your children, they're going to die. He knows. But the, some of the parts of him have been killed spiritually. The poison has walked and moved in places in him that he cannot feel after that anymore. He understands, sympathizes, empathizes, but he can empathize, sympathize, but he cannot feel like you feel. Are you hearing me? That's the power of wine. That's the power of wine. Hallelujah. That's the power of poison. If you've ever been, if you, some of you, if you've ever seen a person stung by, by poison, they start by dying. Certain parts of them start to clog. And then they start to paralyze. And then things, certain parts of them start dying slowly as the poison starts to move around the body until eventually it reaches the heart. Right? And then they're dead. And then they're dead. And then they're dead. I'm talking of someone that you've ever drunk, really drinking, not just... <sighs> okay... Nice. Okay, bye. Good night, guys. No, I'm talking of drinking. You understand? When you're in that level, unless divine intervention comes through, you just can't stop. You can wake up in the morning and all you want is it. And if you're made up to drink, nobody can stop you. Ask, am I lying? You've made up. Nobody. Nobody. That's when they can know you're clever. You can do everything in your wisdom to drink. Anything in the... You can pull any move. That is why, because this is a test sentence of the devil himself, no drunkard can fail to drink, even if he's broke like how. You can fail to get money to go to church. Hmm? But you can never fail to get money to drink. There is always something out there that can feed you even when you don't have. Why? Because this is. It's a spirit. It will feed even the brokers. You see, the brokers people in the world are drunkards. The guy can be broke and he doesn't even have a coin. Nenga, every time he goes out, he comes high. Then you calculate the money he has drunk that year and you're shocked. The plot of land. Are you hearing me? Until God comes through. That man can't stop. It starts to eat them like a poison. Right? Now, there is a pr there's a principle here I want to show you here. That when a man gets addicted to drink, there's a place where in every instance there's a prompting in his spirit that causes him to remember. In fact, the one thing they fight most with is here. Because that remembrance comes with an experience and feel. It's not just a remembrance. It comes with a certain feel of gratification. And at that particular point, it will erode every risk. After, then you can calculate the risks. Okay, now I could have died. What? Carrie, you see, you see. Then you regret. Uh, when they hang over and your head is pounding like they have put a, a nail inside and they're poof, 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 you see. But you weigh these other things after gratification until the next time when it comes through. Are you hearing me? That is why I told people something about the pleasure principle. I never want you to forget. Pleasure, not the experience, but the principle. Pleasure, the principle. 
I want to tell you something about pleasure, the principle. Pleasure, the principle. Hmm? If you examine pleasure as a principle, number one, you will realize that Pleasure is greater than pain. Pain is not greater than pleasure. Some people don't know and understand this, but pain is not greater than pleasure. Pleasure is greater than pain. And I'll tell you the power of pleasure here. A man can be told that because of this diagnosis, you cannot do this anymore. You'll die. Oh, he has even had a spell of sickness because of the same. Are you hearing me? But because of the power of pleasure, that man will find himself going back to the same pleasure, even with the anticipation of how much pain is going to come. It doesn't mean that they are oblivious of the pain. It doesn't mean that they don't recognize that that pain is going to be there. It only means that the pleasure, the heart in them to be pleased, the heart in them to gratify pleasure is bigger than any pain that you could ever inflict on their soul. That's a dying man. They're not dying because of the pain, but they're dying because they've gotten to a point where pleasure has taken over. And when pleasure takes over, it doesn't matter how much pain. I read a story of this late musician who died, George something. The guy used to give him drugs, says he used to pass out. He gets up. Then the next morning he drinks again and passes out. All close to death. They take to hospital, bring out. Then the next day he takes. The consequence of being in hospital was on him. He knew that he had the problem. But pleasure was stronger than pain. Pleasure is stronger than pain. Pleasure is stronger than pain. Pleasure is stronger than pain. You think people who get HIV, they don't know that it is there. They do. But pleasure is stronger than pain. When a man knows that this is pain, it doesn't matter how much pain you'll give. That's why even in the highest pain, certain men respond to pleasure. Are you hearing me? You've seen wars where they shoot a guy and then a guy drinks. They just shot him with a gun. He drinks his bed. Why? Because pleasure is true. He wants to take himself to a place higher than pain. And what does he do? Pleasure. And that is why I tell people, there is nowhere in this world you can ever deliver a man of pleasure without substituting it with pleasure. If you think that you can deliver a man by substituting pleasure with pain, you're wasting time. You can afflict and inflict him with as much pain as you want. You will never take away his pleasure. Because pleasure is not take, taken away by pain. Pleasure is not dealt with by inflicting pain. Are you hearing me? You can never kill a drunkard and he stops. You can never beat a guy and then he stops taking weed. You can't. You can't beat someone out of pleasure. You can't. You can only introduce another pleasure. And that pleasure overrides the other pleasure. That's deliverance. Deliverance. Deliver this letter from Mokono to Kampala. Get this guy from one station of pleasure into another station of pleasure. Rebuke is not enough to get a man from one station of pleasure to another station of pleasure. Afflicting and inflicting pain is not enough to get one man from one station of pleasure to another station of pleasure. You can only deliver a man of that station of pleasure when you introduce him to another station of pleasure. Whereby he finds this pleasure higher than what gave him a height. Are you hearing me? It's like when they say, when that guy became born again, he stopped drinking. It's because he met the most high. <laughs> Do you understand it? But if he has or she has not experienced that, he cannot walk out of that pleasure. When a man is still in it, yet he's born again, 
he has not met that pleasure fully. He's in the process of meeting it. When you meet it, it becomes the ultimate pleasure. Now, that is where love stops to just be an adage. It stops to just be a wonderful word. It stops to be a verb, right? Or a noun, whatever you want to call it. It becomes an experience. Now, the guy who is dealing with God here, he's telling him, draw me. Just draw me. Are you hearing me? I will run after you. We will run after you. And he says, we will rejoice and we will be glad into this thing. And then he says, and we will remember thine love. Are you hearing me? More than fragrant wine. He's saying that I want to be introduced into an experience of love. To a place where if I was a guy who was addicted to alcohol, I could remember you and yearn for you more than a man remembers wine. That is love the experience. That is the place where you start to have God. When you say you love him, oh, it's not something you're saying out of your crude word of abstract political correctness. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I, because it's right for you to love. Oh, how I love Jesus. You understand? Oh, oh I love Jesus. And then how would you love him? I just love him. Why? But in your heart, you love him because it's cool to love him or because you feel you want to love him or because you, 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 you think it's okay to love him or because you have no choice but to love him or because maybe you know what, that he loves you. But there's a place where this love transitions just from love, knowing that I love and he loves me, to the place where it is love that I experience him. Because... The distinctive mark of pleasure is experience. Are you hearing me? A guy gets high and he feels like everything is fine. <laughs> everything is fine. Are you hearing me? It's how the wine used to make you feel. You feel up there. One time I knew a guy got high and told guys, Are you hearing me? His brain told him he can beat the whole... That is faith. That is too much faith. Guy, you are going to go. Come, make a line. Do you know what was in his head? His head, I think, was telling him, that guy comes, you punch him, he goes in the air. By the time he's landing, the other one is going up. You understand? By the time he's landing, the other one is also going up. Don't they start to be like these circus things where you throw things? That was his revelation. Even if you punch him to pulp, if he wakes up, his head will tell him, no, that was a mistake. Come again this time, I'll show you. Are you hearing me? Do you understand what I'm saying? But the reason why it is so, it is because pleasure has an experience. You cannot say that you are in love with God and claim the statement without the experience. And until you ever experience God, you will never understand love. There are people who force it. Eh? I've also been around them. It's called a fanatic spirit. I feel you. I feel you. But you, see, you look at him and say, no. This is not. You're copying someone who has feeling. Are you hearing me? Like some can drink one line and then pretend to be high. Just to get away. You understand with more. Do you understand? Eh? He, he comes, he drinks a little, he's sober, but he says, now I'm going to abuse them. Eh? Deliberately. The guy is sober. He says, Muribasiru. Muribasiru. But the guy is sober. Are you hearing me? But because you know sometimes he takes, he says, now let me take a little just. So that next day I just tell them, you guys, I'm sorry, it was it. How can I do that? I just take enough to smell. 
but I'll abuse them. I know ex everything I want to do. You know, people back in those days when they, 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 they wanted to check the atmosphere. Guys who have dr me, I'm telling you, I've cancelled the guys. People who you don't even know drink. The guy Jay can get a musumba can do kagani. No mugamba. No, let's fix this. So, this guy would say, for example, he wants to test out something. All right? And he says, let me first do it when I'm high. <laughs> he goes to a girl. He speaks words. Are you hearing me? She says, yes. Ah. She says, no. The next morning, he says, what did I tell you? Oh, my God. What? How? What? I told ah, I, I, I hope you know I was drinking. I, you understand? How can I tell you my love? You know I was I was joking. I, 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 this was alcohol. I think I should stop drinking. Uh -huh. What did I tell you? Please tell me. Then he acts like he didn't know. He told me whatever since you said, what? Oh my God, I feel so bad. I shouldn't have done it. But if she says, yes, did I just... Next day, continue. Hi, darling, how are you? DVD player, mobile phone. You understand? So, they used to use it as an excuse. If you ever done it, put up your hand. Don't! I'm joking. But you know someone who did. Okay, don't say it's you. But you know someone who used to do that. So, wine was the excuse to test certain things. If they don't work, they blame the wine. A guy can even hate you and then drink a little and punch you. Eh? Bah! The next day says, man, I don't know what was on my head. My hand is paining. You understand? Then he says, ah, man, you punched me. He bummed it was alcohol. Forgive him. It was alcohol. Yeah, how can I beat you? In my, in my same brain, do you really think I can beat you really? Ah. Some of them use a little and then they act out. Then they, if that's the day of chucking. He just puts in a little tap. He's not high. And he chucks you. Are you hearing me? And he gives it will be a week and then he sees whether his heart is stable. If it refuses, he comes back and says, Man, I don't know. I was high. <laughs> Forgive me. Yeah. Reconciliation. Don't drink again, Jason. Don't drink again. Okay, I won't drink, I promise. But this was the wine. You know that. How can I do that to you? Jason, Jason. <laughs> Praise God. But my point is here. I'm not talking about the acted pleasure. I'm talking about the reality of pleasure. That thing that goes into a place where the experience is not faked. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not just folding your, your face to say, Oh God, I love you. But in your head, I'm like, okay, I really so want badly, so badly want to feel like I love you. Because I look at some brother the other side and I see his experience. Yeah, I'm like, okay, God, even me, I want it. I want to be like him. Now I'm experiencing you the way he's experiencing you. Okay, my God, look at him. He's been crying. Oh, okay, let me fake a tear. Then the tear has revealed, but God, may you know me. You love me. You love me. You love me. Okay, I love you. 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 No, it has refused. Then you see the the guy now is from tears, he goes down on his floor, then you say, okay, now, this is a certain vibe of level of frequency where you flow, let me also go a bit, vertically challenge myself, maybe I'll meet you down, you understand? but in your head you're trying to force something that is not there, reality is, if we put a light in your spirit, the experience is not there. It's not there. Are you hearing me? And for that man who has been faking it, tell him to draw you. Tell him, draw me, God. Just lead me there. I can't lead myself. I'm tired of acting love. Draw me there. I want the reality of love. Let's not act here. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to speak a love I don't understand. Eh? I don't want to act like I do yet I don't or act like I understand what I don't. The issue here between me and two is, you and you is just draw me, just draw me. You know if you do, I will run after you. Because there's a guy seeking you a certain way and I don't know why he can spend the whole night praying and I don't know why I cannot just be there and pray. There's a guy who finds freedom and locks himself every day in the room and he's, he's, he's with you. But me, I can't lock myself up in that room. Honestly, I'll get bored in the last 15 minutes and I'll find myself flitting that channel and then watching something. Because God, I can't fake it. 
That's the place where reality checks in, and then you tell him, God, full circle, check me out here. I can't stay like this. I can't continue acting love. I can't see a man seeking you for 24 hours and he's not doing it for money, Yoka. He really wants you. There's also another guy saying, okay, even me, I showed you 24 hours, but I promise you, I prayed all through and I didn't feel anything. But I showed you because I had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. The reality sets in because until love is revealed, you will never know God. Hallelujah. You will never what? You will never know God. You will never know God. You see, there's a statement I've heard people say. God has poured out his love on me. Have you heard of that statement? I experienced that statement in the second year of my university. God poured something on me. He poured something on me. It disabled my whole body. I died. I started to weep and weep and weep and weep and weep and weep until I got the revelation of what it means to be consumed. We used to sing things like consuming fire. Remember that song? My heart, one desire is to be. Huh? You want it, but it's not there. You want to love God, but it's not there. Are you hearing me? That day I was flipped, consumed. Do you know like you'd get this cloth and then you squeeze it, squeeze it, step on it, break it, put it upright, then you stretch it, then again you bend it and squeeze it until it is no more and then you throw it back. <laughs> That day I was in a suit, eh? and you know, I decided to put on a suit that day. I wanted to feel like I was holy. You understand what I'm saying? The trousers turned the tight. <laughs> Your jacket is like this. Is, is one part. You don't even know. You don't even know how your your buttons suck. You start looking for one of your shoes. You're, you're walking like this. One of your shoes, man. <laughs> I felt sorry for her. You understand? <laughs> You're all dirty. You understand? And then you walk back home. You don't even have the brain to put back your shoe. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't even have the wisdom to say, I was putting on a shoe. No. I, I just remember carrying my shoe like this. You understand? I'm like going back to the house. I didn't want to know whether they put in back the shoes. My God! Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> that was the beginning of experiences. You're in your bedroom alone. You just feel something pouring out on you. You're not trying to cry. No. You're, you're refusing to cry. I don't know that you know that. You know, it's one thing when you're, you're, you're trying to cry, but it's another when you think, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. You know what I do to be a... You know, it's, it's, and then you start to hear him pour out, and then he's pouring out. And then it's, now, me, I understand love as an experience. I don't understand as it as just some loose abstract idea people share. No. Love is supposed to be an experience when it begins from there you you start to know god you start to develop you see love is natural and stuff like that but friendship is is 
a two-way street. Do you understand? God has invited us to the place of friendship. But he expects us to respond to that friendship. He expects us to respond to that friendship. Imagine this guy is out there, and then he says, I want to destroy this place, but how can I hide this from my friend? Abraham, I have to tell this guy. There is no way I cannot tell him. You see, this is not Abraham on a wall trying to seek God for his will. God, what do you plan to do? Oh, you want to destroy Sodom? Okay. What else? Ah, okay. So I asked God, what do you want to do? And then he told me, no, I'm not talking of that kind of relationship. I understand. That's, that's transactional. That's business. That's you trying to qualify yourself that you hear God. I'm talking of the place where God says, this is going to happen. I can't hide it from you. You were not even there to seek it. But you realize you're the only friend he could tell. Oh, not that there are not other friends. Okay, also those ones have their own relationship with him. But that place where he says, no, I cannot hide this from you. I cannot hide this from you. I cannot hide this from you. Why? Because you're my buddy. You're no longer servants. You're friends. You're friends. That's what the scripture says. He says, I call you not servants. For servants knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I've called you friends. But do you? See, he has, right? He has. You have to, too. You see, there's a place where he expects you to. He has. For him, he has opened that invitation of saying, see, I love you, but let's go past that place. Let's, let's get to a place of friendship. The reality of a man telling you, this was a man who had drunk wine. He was not a man who used to hear people drinking wine. When he tells you, I will remember you more than wine, eh? He says, yes, I've drunk this thing and gotten high. But I want to get to a point where I, I will feel the way and more than I used to feel when I was craving for it. That it doesn't matter how much pain is afflicted on my soul, my body or spirit. The pleasure you is bigger than any pain that a man can ever afflict on my soul. If they hurt my emotions, I still have you. If they hurt my body, I still have you. If they betray me and hate me, if they speak evil of me and then wrong me, I still have you. Even if they maimed me and afflicted me, I would still have you. Me with you, that's enough. That's the equation. Nobody else needs to get into this circle. Me, you, period. Anything can come. And I'll still be okay. Why? Because this is a relationship. This is love. This is pleasure. This is experience. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me, child of God? God wants to take you past just you hearing about this love. And please believe me, I know what I'm saying. I'm a man of the Spirit. And I've worked with God long enough to tell you, I can see when a man is taking love. I can see when a man is trying to relate with a God, he thinks, he understands, but he's speaking of a love that is abstract and it's not an experience. I can see when a man loves God. You can see even how that kind of man responds to the word. You can see how they attend meetings. You can see, you can see, you can see, you can feel it and say, no, this person loves God. You can you can tell when love becomes an experience. Are you hearing me? You can. You can. Do you think she cares that she's on the ground now, right now? Do you think she cares that she's smart? Do you understand? Do you think she's caring, oh, I'm too smart, oh, I'm too beautiful, oh, I am too anointed now? To get to that level, do you think she's weighing her clothes and the options and her position and place? And do you think that kind of person cares whether you love her or you don't, or be whether she's an apostle or a prophet or a teacher or an evangelist? Because when you're in this experience, nothing defines you. God only does. Are you hearing me? 
I see many people who act love. It's too painful when I see it. It's too painful. I can almost hear God telling me that one is acting it. They are crying, but they are acting it. It's not, not it. That is not it. Love is a revealed experience. Never forget, revealed experience. And the true representation of a man who has experienced it is the substitution of pleasure. Pleasure is substituted. The things that used to give you a certain joy don't give you a certain joy anymore. The things that used to give you a certain height don't give you a certain height anymore. The things that used to give you a certain joy, they don't give you a joy anymore. The people who used to give you a certain happiness, you realize they don't make you happy anymore. That is why no wonder some people are walking out of your life and you're losing old friends. They were your company then, but he became your ultimate company. When I hear a Christian telling me, Apostle, pray for me, I feel lonely sometimes. I'm like, oh, you haven't experienced. And some of them think that when you find a man and settle down in marriage, it will end. And then you marry him and you still feel lonely. You still feel there is something in there that is missing. You don't have words to describe it. Because the completeness of you is not that man or that woman. What completes you is him with you. That oneness. If he is on your side, who can be against you? Hallelujah. He cannot be. And sometimes I wonder, oh, you're lonely. Why? Because of your age or maybe oh, I'm too old, I'm growing old. Yes. You're even too conscious of your age. You're too conscious of your, your... Man. Until you get to that point where that love becomes so real. And no pleasure defines it like that. Until you get that point where he's the one and only. You, for me, I don't know that it's with the rest of you two, and, I, and I'm not judging. I just want to tell you what I've seen in my life. For me, even if I sit in my room right now, I feel him so naturally. I don't struggle to feel God. I don't struggle to feel, feel God. Because I did one thing right. I allowed the drawing. I didn't invite myself. So every time I'm there, I know he wants it more than I want it. I don't know if they understand what I'm saying. He wants to love me more than I want to love him. I love him because he first loved me, period. That invite, that invitation of him, every time I'm convinced that every time I'm there, he wants to be with me. He wants to be with me. Many of the things you see happen to some of you here, they happen to us too in our closet. We find ourselves weeping. We tell him, God, just keep me sober. Because if you don't, I will not preach. You know it. I could sit on that pulpit and worship and find that I don't want to preach anymore. And this could be selfish because you think I mind being there, worshiping for six hours. I don't. But I'm like, okay, I don't want to be selfish because maybe you want to deliver a word to sister so and so and so. But even, let me tell you, even if I never... You see, some people think that our greatest pleasure is on the altars, those are those pulpits. Let me tell you, God is my witness, and I'm not saying this. You know that I'm speaking from truth. You can check my heart. I know you can examine truth. I prefer the closet than the pulpit. Me, Lubega. I don't mind being with him the whole day. It's the one place that has never given me pressure. It is the one place that I have never, I can struggle with anything, but not with him. Now, I'm asking God to give me the grace to learn to live with people. Because I love being alone. I love my space so much. I love that feeling where I know I'm with him only. Solitude defines, solitude defines everything divine. And until you learn to be alone, you'll never see God. Some of you, you can't be alone. You want company every time you want company, every time you want company. You can just sit and be bored in your room and you want to go out and find someone. You can't even stay in your room. 
Some of us are struggling to be away from men. For you, you want to be with people. You just be there and you're bored. You find that you can't be, eh? You just want to be with some people. Hi, how are you? You know, I remember when we were growing up, before I knew and understood God. You sit in the living room alone, you feel your bored. You hear people jazzing outside, you just want to go and sit in the jazz. You don't even know what it makes, what, where they're coming from. Are you hearing me? Hey, you guys, where are you going? Uh, let's come in. Uh, you run with them to the football. Because you are young. The day I saw and met this God I'm telling you, I always preferred to be alone. Some people, sometimes people don't get it, but I don't want to be with people. Sometimes. That's why it's hard for me to just tell someone, come and I, and you go for tea. I don't do those things. It's not that I don't want to. But if it's a tea, it has to be of purpose. You understand? Eh? I no longer have just a casual tea. Some people just don't get it. I don't hate them. No, I love them very much. But it's what I'm becoming every day because of and I because every moment with him is precious. It is precious. It is precious. It is just so precious. Oh, pray for me. Nobody calls me. Nobody's my friend. Eh? That's a good place. That's a good place when nobody is your friend. Because you're sure you have enough time with him. What are you doing with friends? It's not that it's wrong to have friends. But that is why you notice if you have been close to me either in my car or in... It's hard for me to have a conversation with you and I don't end somewhere talking about God. It's hard. Some I'll share something. I'll make a statement, one or two. But it's hard for me not to include him in that conversation. It's very hard. Next to impossible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because... Wilderness experiences... The ones I always talk about. When you have it, there's a way God can make people leave you and then you start to think of oh, people hate me. You can even have all silly thoughts. Why is it that people reject me? Why is it that when I call this person, they don't answer me? God even spoke rudely to me. I think I'm under rejection. You're not under rejection. God himself is trying to say, look, eh, I, I need to have you for me. Without this guy, without this woman. For you, you think it's a spirit of rejection, but me, I just want to have you alone. Eh? So yes, they are going. It's okay. Let them go. But I just want to have this you. And if you endure that moment and judge God not foolishly or yourself, you cultivate a life of being alone with him. And when you cultivate that life of being alone with him, it becomes too hard to just sit with people. It's not that I don't sit with people and judge. No. Purpose. By the time I'm sitting with you over tea, or, uh, there has to be something. I just don't sit. I just don't sit. Bo ah, I'm bored. Let me just go out. I can't. I don't have that time to be bored anymore. Because there is enough to keep me. Hallelujah. What do you think you can ever possess? You see, some of you don't understand this, but solitude. If you can write this, write it. Solitude. Solitude with the divine, right, draws the deepest meditations. For revelation, that oneness with God is what launches you deep to meditate on a and get as much revelation as can that when you start sharing you leave nothing out you leave nothing out yet there is more but you leave nothing out yet there is more why because when you're one with him there's a certain meditation that that hits your spirit are you hearing me? There's a certain meditation that hits your spirit. And that's the basis of Him revealed. That's, 
the basis of him revealed. And that revelation is your knowledge of him. Are you hearing me? And he says, and they that know their God shall do mighty exploits. I dig so deep when I'm with him. Because that solitude for me is me and him. I just find that my meditations just go deeper and 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 deeper. So I realize every time the more I'm alone with him, the more I launch deep. That is why many of you notice on Thursdays I don't move out. I want to stay with him the whole day until I get on that altar. I'm not just rah, 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 rah. no no I'm just with him. It's enough to just know he's with me and we are with him. We can talk and laugh and and I find myself speaking psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in my heart and, and I'm walking around and I'm speaking these things and I'm digging so deep into it. Usually I write my sermon almost one or two hours to service. That's when I just collect. Okay, I think I'm gonna go this way. I can't struggle to, today I preach three different sermons, and all of them are deep. You see, I can't struggle, even if you tell me tomorrow preach three, I'll still have something to say. Because of that solitude, I've, I've enjoyed that relationship for many years. Many years. I, from every angle I see things, I can go in a song of Solomon and see it. You see, because I've, I've, I've been there for many years. And every day it becomes better. Every day it becomes sweeter. Hallelujah. And I pray that our last years of the earth, on the earth, will be more and more with him. You understand? And I mean that you'll abandon your family. You know, your family will be there, children will be there, that's okay. But in the end it's him. There's a way he makes you feel. No man can ever make you feel that way. No person can ever make you feel that way. Nothing in this world can possibly. If you still have something that you can give time to, to give you that place, you still need help. You still need help. Hallelujah. Speak in other tongues.
how could I explain the love that is plain and cold? any place or outside but you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. If you have a need, God is making it in your speech. God is making it up. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at Compala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.